and get back to our actual talk. Am I there? Am I here? Okay, yes. Okay. So, welcome everyone. This talk is a me trying to be too clever uh, title of Error Too Much Helm. Um, and we're talking about a journey of being a maintainer. So, the, what's interesting about this, as much as Martin and I were joking, um, I've been doing this for about two and a half years, three years maybe at this point, and Martin's been doing it for a little while. And so, we just wanted to give it, uh, a little bit of a talk about how you can be a better contributor or start contributing or whatever it might be. Okay, so my name is Martin. I'm a developer at IBM and I'm a core maintainer out in Helm. Uh, so I've been in the community for about a year and yeah, so I just want to you know, get our stories out there. So over to you, Taylor. Yeah, so like it says up here, I'm one of the core maintainers as well. Um, I have worked on AKS at Microsoft and I work at Hel on Helm stuff as well. And then, um, I mean, there's all my social media stuff as well and I have spent way too much time with containers in my career and have some amazingly terrible battle stories if you ever want to hear them. And so, yeah, that's me. So first off is this question. So you want to be a contributor. Um, now, I just want to start it off with a note. Now, I absolutely love the Helm community. Uh, one of the things that I really loved and gravitated towards um, as of this community particularly is just kind of the welcoming nature of everything. Um, it's very warm and generous and the people who, and the things people do to help each other out and, and kind of get people involved uh, made a huge difference. There's lots of things that everyone still does to contribute, even the small fixes that help us out a lot as maintainers. So this talk is really intended to help um, you best contribute to such a large project with just some practical examples and ideas and questions answered. Yeah, but like everything, when you're when you're stepping out in something for the first time, it can, you know, be a little bit scary. You're not sure where to go, whatever. So, you know, it can be a bit overwhelming. Wemeling, uh, oh, yeah, we stumbled over that word. <laughs> so moving on. So, just I think take it easy on yourself when you're first coming in, okay? Um, and there's a few ways you can go about this. And probably one of the first things to do is get into our commun communication forums. So we've We've, um, uh, we're out on uh, Slack, so we're under the Kubernetes uh, workspace, and we've uh, three channels out there. So we have Helm users, which is for your common uh, all around questions on Helm, and is a good place to kick off. Helm dev, when you're, it's some dev oriented contributions, maybe around the PR, et cetera, and then there's also the charts channel, okay? We also have a Twitter account, so please follow that, and you'll get updates on that. And also uh, join our mailing list. Um, next up, I'd say um, get yourself up and running, OK? Um, so what I mean by that is uh, have a look at the documentations. Uh, that's really a good first step. Um, then maybe start playing around with it. You know, if you can have a cluster somewhere on the cloud or just a local cluster with Minikube or Kind, etc. Um, get it going because it's easy to deploy Hel to get Helm going and then basically deploy your charts out. We have tools like Helm Create and we'll go through them in a minute. Um, and join our Dev Weekly calls. So that's on every Thursday at, I would imagine, 9.30 PST? Yeah, 9 which 30, is... 9.30 tech standard time. I mean, Pacific time. Yeah. Or let's, let's do it in my currency, which is... Uh, 5.30 p.m. Irish time, or uh, British time, whatever you want, or 6.30 Central European time. And then, and that's a great place to come in, and if you ever have a question, please, we open it up to the floor as well, I have a question, so, or you just want to come and listen. I just came and listened for a while, uh, so I was like this shady figure in the, in the background. And then eventually one day I asked a question, you know, and uh, yeah, got me going from there. And the last one then is, and this is kind of something that, that you know, it comes up a lot of time in open source communities. Choose the area you'd like to work in. And that sounds like an obvious thing, but people come in and they really want to help. And then you say, well, what kind of area are you interested in? And, and yeah, just, you know, have a think of what you'd like or even ask questions. It doesn't really matter. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's good to have a think about it as well. Yeah, and so that leads us into that final point from the final point that Martin said into the, la the big chunk of what we want to talk about is what are the ways and the areas in which you can contribute? Um, so there are four major ones that we have listed here. Community management is more, um, I use that term very loosely. I, you're not necessarily managing the community, although that is a possibility as well. It's more about the communication aspects and helping out with meetings or planning local meetups. We'll talk more about it. Um, documentation, I think, is self-explanatory. 
um, issues and bugs. And then um, that's, I guess, self-explanatory as well. And code. And code is a little bit more complex than just writing the code. There's some other things to know about as well. So we're going to go ahead and uh, dive into those different areas. So the format this is going to take here is um, we're going to kind of ask each other some questions like kind of panel format, but it's a panel of one. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, you know how that's going to go. Nobody else can <laughs> come on the panel, by the way. So we're going to just try to answer some of the common questions we've seen and um, answer those best we can. So I'm going to ask questions on this one. Uh, so Taylor, how can we help out in the community? Well, there's a couple different ways here that I've always noticed. One of the things is um, meetups, like I kind of mentioned before. Um, if you're uh, doing, if you're involved with a local meetup in any way, trying to see if you can either submit or accept talks that um, are about Helm, um, really, especially anything that is not KubeCon Helm, like Helm related talks, because there's plenty of other spaces where people want to figure out how others are using Helm, and it might just involve Helm for part of what you're talking about. Um, you can answer questions on the mailing list that Martin uh, mentioned or on Slack. That's very useful. That's how I got started was answering questions on in Helm Dev um, based on what I could find. And um, you can give constructive feedback that way as well, whether that's through proposals or through different um, PRs and things that are going on. And what's nice about Slack and like IRC before is, and that was the scariest thing first time I went out in IRC years ago was, you know, you ask one question and you're talking to someone, the next thing 20 people have come in and they're answering at the same time. And uh, yeah, that is actually very, very good. It opens you up to a lot of people, so yeah. So, so if you wanted to do something like writing a blog post or doing a topic, like who can you talk to? How'd you get going? Um, stuff like that. So question, how many of you know that there's a Helm blog? Raise a hand by chance. Hey, it's a little bit more than I was expecting. So guess what? There's a Helm blog. Um, you can find it at uh, helm.sh slash blog. Um, now, this blog is actually very, very useful. And what we look for, this isn't some like carefully curated. I mean, I work for Microsoft, but I can definitely tell you this is not some like weird Microsoft controlled blog. This is an open community blog um, that all you have to do to submit something to is open a PR um, and then ask for somebody to review it. So um, if you don't know what to talk about or if you want to run an idea by us, that's fine. Feel free to ping us on Slack. But the bl a blog post is actually one of the best ways to get involved with the community. And we're looking for those battle-tested stories. The only real rule we have is no product pitches because that's not a good use of people's time on this blog. It is a community open blog. We're supposed to try to make sure we can share stories about how we can help others. And you should have your own blog in your company anyway. So Yeah, yeah that's true. So I think we kind of answered that last question yeah, as well. I think we've done well there. Yeah. Are we moving on? Yeah, let's move on. Yeah, let's move on. Who's asking the questions this time? Oh, I am, I think. So sure. documentation. Um, so just first question that I think we could get a lot, Martin. Where are the docs at? Oh, yeah. If you're looking for your docs, it's quite easy. You can go just do a search, Google search for Helm Tree Docs, for the new Helm Tree Docs that are coming out, and all the good work that has been done on that, to Ronan and, and all the people that have pitched in in it. Or if you're looking for the current docs for Helm 2, just look for Helm Docs. You can also look at helm.sh slash docs, and that will get you to the Helm 2 docs, or v3.helm.sh slash docs. Okay, I'm trying to do this from the top of my head. Uh, so there we go, um, and um, yeah, that's a good place to go to docs. Also, go out to the community page as well. We have some good docs in there around contributing, uh, ways to get started and things like that. And one little kind of story on this, because it's something we've kind of noticed, well, I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, uh, or maybe a couple of months is, and this has happened to a few people, and this is not uncommon to anyone out there that buys something, and decides, I know how this works. So you take it out of the box, and away you go. And then after a few things going wrong, you decide to take out the instruction manuals. So this is kind of the same too, where people actually literally dive in and start doing things, and then they go, well, well what happened here? So you, know, you, you say, all oh, right, this is what happened. And uh, you, know, you give a link to the doc, and they go, oh, you have the docs? And I say, yeah, yeah, it's, the doc's fairly handy here. And then they're trying to do really complex stuff, and you're saying, you know, maybe read through the docs first and go, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. So the docs are, like, jump in there, have a look at them, they're very good. Um, 
Yep. One well, that kind of leads into it. So what are you, what are what do we look for in the project in terms of docs? Like what is what is it that we look for to have inside of those documentations? What doesn't belong in there? Yeah. So we definitely we love contributions to docs. Okay. Um, and first off, if you want spelling, grammar, etc., please get in there. Definitely Taylor when he puts in his docs. You know. Yeah. Some of the grammar there sometimes. You know we have to. Yeah. That's a joke. Sorry. So. Yeah, we, we take all that, definitely come in with that. If you're adding, extending in the dock in some way or a section or adding new capability, I suppose what we're looking for here is, and this was explained to me a long time ago, probably maybe after a couple of years of development, and you know, how many developers out there do not like writing docs? Hands up. Okay. This was explained to me. Uh, what happens? If somebody here, so you'd write, you'd put some sort of doc together. Imagine if you were the person at the other end of, of the internet trying to use our product with the docs you put out there. Do you think they'll be able to use it? And then it went, no, okay, write better docs. Just think of that person that's trying to use it, and that's what we're looking for. Clean, concise, good examples were re required and just think and walk in the steps of that person that has to use it and then what it means then is you know afterwards then when people are looking for questions or you're trying to help out in the community you can just give them the link and say oh, i wrote that and it really is important i know that it i to add to that i always think of at, at even worse like if somebody's had a stressful week and they're dealing with stuff at home and then all of a sudden like they're trying to figure out something at work and you're starting to use helm and then like that's the kind of thing I put in my in my head when I'm trying to write docs is like, can I just like see it? And I'm not going to get frustrated from that. Um, that's that's one of those things I look for. So um, now one of the other questions that people ask is then like, what if I want to add something completely new to the docs, whether that's a new example or a new way of doing things? And that's my bad because I forgot to tell my computer to stay up. Um, but what is the way that we can what is the way to go about like adding something new? Is there anyone I should talk to? How does that work? Yeah, no, I think this applies to probably any contributions you want to do. This isn't to say that we don't want you to put contributions in, but I think it's always worth checking. You know, reach out in Slack, maybe ping someone, you know, even send a mail to the mailing list, you know, smoke signals, we don't mind. Um, but it's sometimes good to ask because, you know, you see it sometimes in, 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 in Helm and in other open source communities, somebody puts a hell of a lot of work into something and uh, they realize then when it's going to be reviewed that it was already in process, it was just on the way in, or else it was something we looked at a long time ago and it's not applicable, okay? So it's kind of like, you know, the carpenter, you know, measure twice, cut once. So it is worth connecting and find out what's going on because we want to get the PRs in, but it has to be, I suppose, suit what's in the project, etc. Perfect. So I think next up is our issues and bugs stuff, so which I think I'm asking you some more questions. So this will be entertaining. All right. I got oh boy! Smile on my face because I right. thought I was asking the questions. But <laughs> so the that first question there is the how do maintainers triage issues and how do what's the whole process that's followed and what issues do you get to first? Okay. So I suppose our generous modus operandi would be, you know, depends on the person, but either maybe first thing in the morning or an hour in the morning or two or the middle of the day or the evening, but basically we, we, we select a block of time and go through some of the issues that have come in overnight um, or else some of the issues that we've been working on and feedback has come and we try and work through that. So I suppose one of the most, you know, one of the most difficult ones are the ones where you get, I suppose, the version of um, Kubernetes, the version of, um, of uh, Helm, and then this does not work. Um, so why that one is difficult is, and that's why sometimes an issue goes on for a long time is, e, you know, posting comments over and back, they take a hell of a lot of time. And you know, it can frustrate you if you've raised the issue. But if we're not sitting at the desk with you or eating dinner every night with you, we don't really know what the problem is unless we get the output. So it's, it's when we ask those questions, we're not trying to you know, question you, well, we are, but we're just trying to figure out what is the problem so we can reproduce the problem. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of how that works, yeah. Yeah, and I just rem remember, like, it's for us when we're, we're approaching these issues, 
Um, it's not that we're trying to like favor one over the other, but if there's one that we can see and we can tackle and there's a chart that with an example attached to it and all those types of details, that's the first one we're going to go tackle. And it's not because we don't like you with your other issue that says this is wrong. It's because um, we're, we can actually work on that one really quickly and understand what's going on. Whereas when you're when it's less clear on an issue, what will happen is somebody will jump on and say, oh, I think I have this problem too. And then the original commenter comes back and says, no, it's actually this, and then clarifies. And then it kind of explodes into this thread that goes 20 different directions. So it's all about just trying. This is about even if you're not going to be a like long-term contributor, it's something to think about when you're submitting an issue. So now I guess the next one, Martin's really good at this one. That's why I thought it would be good to ask him is how do you debug issues? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so generally actually, I, and I, I mentioned it today when the talk this morning about the, you wouldn't believe how useful the scaffold chart is. Okay, so if you're debugging yourself or whatever, now obviously it depends on the situation, but for a lot of situations where you come in and it may be syntax around a chart or something like that, what we often do, I don't know if all of us do it, but I think what a lot of us do is we, we just we spit out a scaffold chart, we modify it around to whatever we're trying to do to see if we can repro reproduce the problem. Because like really, you know, it's like the onion, like it's the unraveling of the onion until you find where the core of the problem is. Because often the solution isn't as difficult as trying to find the problem. So that's how we often work around the scaffold chart, and that may be a starting point for us. And sometimes what we, what we do, and I've seen from people like Matt and, and Taylor, et cetera, is that, you know what I mean, we spit out then what we get. So we show the commands we're running, we show the output, and then we go over and back with the person to, to and fro. And, and you know what, it is actually quite enjoyable. Like maybe for the person who's got the issue, it's not as enjoyable, but you know, when we're trying to work it out, there is there's something nice about trying to find the problem Obviously, if it's not a Pandora's box and you open it and you go, well, we'll shut that, sorry. Yeah, we, can, we can't fix that one. But for general, yeah, we, we like to get to that. Yeah. And then the last one's kind of related to that. What are all those labels for and how do you know what they mean? Okay. Um, yeah, so what we generally do is, so if you want to go into the, communi into the community and the contribution docs, you'll find where all the labels are specified. Um, and generally what we have things we for feature, if it's a new feature, uh, bug for a bug. Um, we have refactor, and then we have, if you ever see question support, don't uh, get too excited. Stay calm. Question and support usually means we're not saying your t you, the issue you have is not a problem. All we're saying is we're trying to ascertain what the problem is before we stick a bug on it. Okay, so that's all we're trying to do. And sometimes, yeah, because question support we use as well for when somebody's asking a question like, do you know what I mean? Um, you know, how do you get to, I don't know, the canals in Amsterdam or something like that? You know, there's often a kind of a generic laid question. But uh, yeah, so we'll often put question and support in it when we're not so sure if it's a bug and we just want to make sure, okay? All right. Time to so move on. This is my part, yay. Woo. So code and test, Taylor. Oh boy. Okay, so this is an interesting one because I know that. Well, I at least asked maybe, the question. maybe it's just me. Well, I'm just giving a little intro. Oh, yeah? Okay, fine. Go ahead. No, you go with the intro. Kay. Go on. No, I was just saying this one's really interesting to me because people think, like, oh, contributing, that means I write code, right? Well, now we're actually to the code at the very end because it's not the only thing that makes the project run. So now we're going to actually talk about the code if that's what you're curious about. Yeah, so I think th that's, that's a great point from, from uh, Taylor is that, look, you know, every contribution is a contribution. Uh, and I know this gets said uh, in a lot of places uh, in every community, but we mean this. So it's not all about writing code. If you love code, great, yay. Uh, if, there, if you love docs, yay, test, etc. So I suppose the first question is when we mention PRs, remember it's PRs for everything, uh, docs, etc. So how do you review and test your PRs? Okay, so this is one that I know is very interesting for people. Um, we have to consider a bunch of different things when it comes to code. And those factor heavily into what our decisions are with a PR. Um, one of the, if you attended my talk yesterday about the weight flag, that's a good example of it. Had I submitted that weight PR today, oh yeah, that thing would have been rejected flat out. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so I learned from that, and we, I think we all learned as as maintainers from that experience that when we look at it, we're looking for other things about. Um, what I call like the knock-on effects. It go, it's like a domino effect. It goes from one thing to the other. That was one of the reasons that, for example, we rejected the um, templating your values file. Um, I wrote up a long explanation in there specifying why. We weren't just capriciously just knocking it down, but 
we were, um, and we had specific reasons for not doing it because it was going to affect multiple other components around it in ways that would have made it hard to maintain. So when we go through code, we're looking for its maintainability, what the code looks like, if it, if it meets the standards we need it to, um, if it actually solves the, the problem it's saying it's solving. Um, you'd be surprised how many times that there's that miscommunication because we're meat bags and we don't communicate very well. Um, so, meat bags. Speak for yourself. Yeah, I, I don't anyway. even know what so, that phrase is. It's, anyway, meat bags, humans, us. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I, we generally go about in reviewing and testing PRs. We try to make sure we get through them and once again, it's the same thing as the issues. You, if you have it, look, make sure you get them all put together well. So how do you get that feature, be it small, medium, large, merged into the code? So the way that we do this is really, first off, we, you have to remember that there's still manual testing that needs to be done. Um, we're working on getting an acceptance test uh, framework in that will make some of this be easy, but we try to test for some of the edge cases. When that's you there already. What? We have, we have. No, I get it all hooked in. Oh, yeah, yeah, we sorry. have acceptance testing stuff. We're just trying to hook it all together into Helm 3. Um, but there's still manual testing and edge cases that we have to handle because that's what we generally do when we grab your code. Okay, that looks like it works. Now, what if I like try to shove a chart that looks like this into the into the PR? What happens? And so that's what we're doing with it. And so when you when we're trying to get feature whatever you want merged, if you have a test example, whether that's in the issue that you're linking to, or if this is a new thing, that's something where you upload the actual um, chart, something that we can use to test and replicate, show how you did the steps to replicate. You could say, I tested all these scenarios and did all these things. Um, Matt Fisher's really good at that. He always lists every single test scenario he ran it through. Um, those are the kind of details that really, uh, really help us n uh, get through APR fast, because otherwise there's a lot of back and forth again. Yeah. And what Taylor's saying here, this, obviously, when you're ever putting functionality in anyway, and when you're extending or whatever, you are required to have your unit tests. So this is really in addition to your the unit tests that you'd be expected to deliver. Hmm. Well, yeah, and that kind of answered there, like, that last question that about tests, but. Um, so, well, we haven't, we haven't got to that test. Yeah. Okay. No, the last part? Go ahead. You're the one asking the questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, how'd you get started working on the code? Uh, this is a great one. So the normal way to do this is to look for the good first issue uh, label. Um, now, I will be completely honest, for V3 things, we have not been really good with that because we've been more focused on getting V3 out. And to be honest, a lot of the V3 features have been like, if you're new to Helm, you probably don't want to dive in on because you'll find yourself drowning really quickly. Um, but generally, just look for those small little things, whether those, if you're trying to get into the docs, you can find some of the small doc changes first. There's, there's plenty of small features or enhancements that people ask for, and those are the good things to kind of go into and look for first. Just on that I on the issue that you see with the bug in, or if you want to do something, just kind of claim it and say, hey, I'm going to work on this. Or if you're just trying to open a PR and there's no specific issue, you can say in the Helm Dev channel, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this something you'd be willing to look at? We'll probably say, yeah, just make sure to consider this, and then when you open the PR, we'll take a look. That's how we do that. Okay, so around testing, how do we run our tests? Um, yeah, what level of testing? Yeah, so we tr expect unit tests on most PRs, except for there's certain parts of Helm where it's more like you can't really test it in a unit testy way very easily. Um, that's what we're doing for the acceptance testing, which will be hooked up pretty soon here to Helm 3. Uh, but make sure that you have your your unit tests in place, and then we'll get the acceptance tests in place, which then you should be able to run as well. We're going to make sure that that's as easy as possible. Okay, so uh, the acceptance tests are in, so you can now run them? They're not in yet. They are? Well, the, the acceptance tests are there, but you cannot easily run them yet. We don't have it all hooked in, do we? No, uh, yeah, I put a PR in the last day. Oh, wait, well, yeah. Martin hooked but it no, in. No, I didn't put a PR in. <laughs> I, re I reviewed it. So yeah. uh, Mark and uh, Josh, they did a great project. They put a lot of work into the acceptance testing project that's in the Helm org. And we have one or two uh, PRs that have been hooking it in lately, so you should be able to run your uh, acceptance test now. Okay? Um, ooh. Put me on the spot. Have a look at the make file, actually, for the acceptance test. I cannot remember the tag on that. Also, when you're running your own local tests, in case you don't know on, on that is, you just go um, uh, make test, and they'll run your test. Or you can go into specific, um, if you want to run a specific one, using go test and the particular test you want to run. And I think that's it for us, but we just wanted to leave it open just for some questions really quick. If there are any suggestions, ideas, or things that you think would help out the community, 
um, or any questions we didn't answer that you'd like to ask. Sweet. You know, Dan, uh, like how, what's the average number of uh, like days does it take for a new contributor to join and merge the first PR? So any statistic around that? So the question was, what's the average amount of days for a contributor to get started and merge a PR? It really depends. Uh, Martin, how long was it for you? Uh, I actually, I, I actually don't know. Oh no, um, yeah, the first one I actually did ended up being a plug-in uh, on its own. Um, I don't know. It, yeah, I think it depends on the situation. So, like, you know, it can be quite quick, or it can take you a bit of time. Um, I, I know a lot of people start, and it's a good thing around any syntax and stuff like that. That shouldn't take long. And I, I suppose w one point I have to do, say is because it, for the last uh, definitely couple of months or more, and we're trying to balance support of uh, Helm V2 and get V3 out the door, that we are overloaded and we are a small um, a community of core develop or uh, core maintainers. So you know, just have patience with us as as we work through uh, through this. But I think it's yeah, it depends on the situation. Yeah. Uh, next. I think my question goes along with the patience and um, what type of uh, channels and techniques we should use to like poke and say, hey, I've got this PR. Uh, you know, should we do it through Slack or just directly in the PR or issue? And how do we raise attention when we feel the patience on our end is getting too low? Everybody ping Martin. Um, no. so <laughs> thank you for putting that in the microphone. Thank you. Um, no, so the, uh, the way that I would recommend is first start in the issue. Um, sometimes it's really hard. Like GitHub notifications are all set differently for everybody. And sometimes it happens like somebody was out on paternity leave or somebody was out on vacation or whatever might have happened and things slip through. It happens to me all the time. And that's where generally just a nice gentle reminder ping on Slack. And generally in public because sometimes like, oh, hey, Martin can't handle that PR right now. Maybe I can't. Um, right now, it's a, like Martin said, it's a little bit more difficult with the, the V3 stuff because we're trying to push that out the door and make sure that that is ready and solid for everybody. So it's just been a lot of focus on that. So there's been some things where it's just like smaller things that have kind of been left because we're trying to focus on those things that need to get done for the PR, for the Helm 3 stuff. So Yeah, so just bear with us. I, I think it'll come out in the wash once, once we go GA. Uh, and, 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 you know, we can free up. So there's only a limited amount of people. Um, and unfortunately, we can't get people to work for 48 hours a day. So uh, we're trying to get those clones in, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, well, next. I know I think that's it, Martin. I think we're out of time now. Are we out of time? Yes, we are. Okay, so thank sorry. you, everybody. Yeah. So just feel free just to ask us after. Yeah, walk around. Yeah, buy us beer or whatever you want. Yeah, yeah we're okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye.